Hi everyone, I'm Jeremy Cordo, and this little beauty, I think, is probably the modern day equivalent to the E-Type Jaguar. Same sort of growl and mystique and character. And it's unique in cars these days because usually they have one team that works on the front design and one team that works on the back. And I swear they never talk to each other, but in this case, the back is as beautiful as the front and it goes wonderfully as well. Welcome to the show. I hope you'll stay with us and enjoy it around the city, the state, the country and the world wide web. This is the Court of Public Opinion. Great to have your company. Homemade, handmade television from the heart and from the garage and a current affairs program like no other from a garage that's really like no other. So many things to talk to you about, but this Holden bailout business has erupted again. Let me quote to you from the Fin Review uh, Tuesday the 2nd of April. This is kind of a running feast for journalists. General Motors Holden received $2.2 billion in federal handouts over the past 12 years. They may as well not make cars. They could make widgets and we'd never see them and as long as we, the taxpayers, were paying them the money, we'd keep this factory going and people coming to work and doing th stuff and then going home. But no. They're making cars. What is the problem? I think it's time to bite the bullet. As a wise person once said, capitalism without failure is like religion without sin. It just doesn't work. You go into business, whether you're a corner deli or you're a farmer or whatever you do, and you make a living. You pay your overheads, you pay your taxes, and then you've got your profit from which you employ people. And you can't put your hand up if things don't go well and say to the taxpayer, well, can't make the payroll this week. I'm afraid you're going to have to um, come to the party or I'll have to sack these people. Now, what is that? Is that blackmail? Is it a badly run company? Is it a company making the wrong product? Now, in this week where we remember Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady, and I was listening to the British Prime Minister on uh, BBC overnight, and he was saying, this woman not only led the country, she made the country. Now, you'll see what I'm getting at in a couple of seconds. When she inherited Britain, it wasn't Great Britain, it was suffering from this terrible thing called the English disease, which was basically, as, as I remember it, uh, the unions running everything. Now, when you had the coal mines, you had a great employer. Hundreds, thousands, thousands and thousands of people employed mining coal. But it was so expensive to mine the coal, it was just ridiculous. The taxpayer had to come around, a little bit like making motor cars, I suppose. Your taxpayer had to come around and fund the whole thing to keep the jobs. Now, why was it so expensive to mine coal in England in those days? The unions had extracted a totally unsustainable, unrealistic deal, which was great for the workers, and the unions were doing their job, but the thing wasn't sustainable. You ca it can't cost you more to get the coal out of the ground than it is when you go to sell it. You've got <laughs> you've to make a profit. And you can't have the taxpayer picking up the tab. So what are the alternatives? You know the, the old saying that the most protected industries in the world, protected by tariffs and other means, and there are many of them, by the way, the most protected industries are the least efficient. Now, the more we protect the car industry for the jobs, and I have sympathy for Holden's. I really do. I think they're in a difficult position but they're probably in the wrong country making the wrong product. Uh, later on in the show, we're going to take this to the street, by the way, but I believe they're doing it all the wrong way. You can give the car industry a subsidy, but you don't give the car maker the subsidy because that can end up in Detroit or it can end up in Tokyo. What we need to do is to give the people, to give you and me the subsidy or the encouragement, the incentive to buy the Australian product. You know, that's all it takes. We would buy the Australian product, just give us a reason to do so. Our first guest on the show, coming up, Andrew Killey, 
great man of advertising. We'll talk to him about this and a lot of other stuff as well here in the Court of Public Opinion. This is one of those wonderful weeks or one of those awful weeks when there's so much stuff to talk about and so much to decide, are we going to take this one to the street or that one to the street? Uh, what we can't take to the street uh, and get our jury to um, deliberate upon this week, we'll hold over till next week. But basically, this, and it's a very crass sort of headline, isn't it? Cash for kidneys. They could have thought of something a little bit more uh, delicate than that. But the idea is not bad. The government says that they'll give an employer uh, six weeks' salary to reimburse someone who has gone into hospital to generously give his or her kidney. Now, we've done on the program before this topic, we know we're not the most generous when it comes to organ donation. We're not perhaps the least generous either. But is that a slippery slope, paying people for their organs? I don't know. We'll, we'll talk to you about that. What makes you happy? It's a very generic thing to take to the street. I mean, I wouldn't like somebody to bowl up to me in the street and say, what makes you happy? <laughs> I'd say, not having somebody bowl up to me in the street asking me what makes me happy, sort of thing. Um, changes to superannuation, we've got of course the Holden business of more and more taxpayer money going to car makers who should be able to make a profit, and they can't make a profit, they shouldn't be making cars, may I gently say. And also welfare. Is it too easy to get onto welfare? 825,000 people on the invalid support pension. And when I first started talking about this on radio, it was about I don't know, 400,000, and I thought that was extraordinary. That's only a few years ago. It's, it's increasing dramatically. Let me introduce you to Andrew Killey from KWP, which is, may I say, the best advertising agency in our city. Thank you very much. And, and, and you, you're not head office somewhere else, are no, you? No, no, no. We, we reside, live here. We have clients outside the state, which is a nice reversal for South Australia. God we, bless you. We have clients in Queensland and New South Wales and Victoria, yeah. Western Australia. Yeah. I was scratching around the other day trying to find anyone of a national size or even a very big state size mm. who actually had the temerity to have his office, head office and decision making in South Australia. It was very difficult to find anybody. And, and it's become more so in our industry in, in marketing and communications. It's, mm. uh, I mean, you would find that in most cases the, the, the radio stations are not run here and no, television newspapers stations, aren't, no. you know. But it's, um, and it's, it's really been a, a hard thing for our industry here because uh, it is a good thing to have locally owned media and certainly locally managed media and locally run news services uh, because then you have locally run and operating crews and so forth, which helps our industry. What have we done wrong? I can remember, I, uh, mm. and it's not a long time ago, people would fly into Adelaide to have Street Remley do their radio oh, ads. Yeah. Yeah. Max Pepper, yeah. people would come from all over the country, if not the world, mm. to have Max. Yeah. And then there was Ian Kidd who would do their uh, logos and yep. trademarks and all yep. that kind of thing. There are still we we still have uh, some very very good uh, practitioners in this town like uh, Kojo Productions, Anifex, uh, and the, the they've mainly moved into the digital area. But you're right. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, intellectual property that that's left the town, and the reason that's happened is because. Um, I mean, we're, we're an advertising industry and we, we make ads that need products to be, have ads made about. And so when uh, the big brands started to either go out of business, uh, relocate their head office or, you know, just merge or whatever, well then with that, uh, a lot of the uh, 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 companies that were servicing those, those, those clients, those brands, uh, most of whom are multinationals, they withdrew. And so uh, f in the last 20 years, we've had um, many, many big, famous multinational companies that have uh, packed up their tent and gone because they're not seeing the work. Now, if there's not the work, then you have the problem of, uh, well, where do the people go? Where do the photographers go? Where do the copywriters yeah. go? Where do the art directors go? Yeah. Uh, where do the cameramen go? Where do the sound recorders go? 
And they're usually people that have, you know, they've, they've got to make a living like a sort. Yeah, yeah. Well, and we so they local, re relocate. Yeah, well, we keep local production here yeah, with, with yeah. some paid, but mostly volunteers because they just want to stay in the state and they yeah. love the business of making television. Yeah. Now, you, you're going to do something about this. You've got a proposition, I take it. Well, it's a, there's a... A, a remedy, I hope. Yeah, well, it, I think so. I'd like to start a, a movement, and it's, it's euphemistically called the CIA, and it's the... <laughs> that could work. <laughs> it's, it's got a resonance in it. <laughs> Doesn't it? <laughs> um, but it's the Creative Industries, uh, Industries Association. And yeah. if you look at the creative industries, and I'm not talking about the arts, I'm talking about uh, marketing, I'm talking about research, I'm talking about architects, I'm talking about furniture designers, fashion, advertising, people like that. Typically and by and large, most of those companies are SMEs, small to medium sized enterprises or they're one or two men and women shops. Yeah. And they, they, they operate in a cocoon. And I think there should be a, a joint venture between business and government that uh, does two things. The first thing is we, we, through a process of elimination and figuring it out, find out who are the, the good up and coming creative, commercial creative people in town and we should uh, give them a bursary or a scholarship to travel yes. and either go to a conference or do an internship or whatever. That's a, and then bring it back. And then I would like to see a repository in the CIA mm. that is a, a digital world whereby they bring that back and they are, they are duty bound because they've been invested in to put their, their learnings and that uh, on the web. And so other industries can uh, uh, access them and get get some in input into their lives. Because when you work in a cocoon, when you work within state borders, you don't see what's going on around the world. That's the first thing. The second thing, and quickly, I think we should become a creative hub again, because we were a creative yes. hub. And the new state brand talks about being creative and industrious and all those, and I, I support that and I applaud it. But I think once a year, once every two years, we should replace the festival of ideas, which I have grave reservations about, mm. to the, a festival, if you like, of, uh, of commercial creative uh, enterprise. Yes. That and we, we actually turn it into a worldwide event, an international event, whereby we attract some of the great speakers or the great, you know, if we got Renzo Piano, uh, to come here and talk about architecture. Yes. Now, any creative person, whether they're designing fashion, furniture, or they're doing ads, would love to hear a great creative mind like that, a commercial Absolutely. creative mind. Well, so we should have a we should have a conference here, and it should become the sort of thing we could tie it in with tourism, we could tie it in with you know mm. our food and our wine, all the great things, the hospitality of yeah, South Australia. Yeah. It's a great thing. Well, you could replace the thinker in residence. Uh, with a doer in residence. <laughs> what you're thinking of is certainly a doer. Oh, absolutely. And I, I'm thinking of recognising that there is a commercial creative industry group of people that if we don't keep them stimulated and keep them up with what's going on in the world and that, this could be a great industry for us. I mean, we, oh, could, God, be yes. the, we could be the Silicon Valley of creativity. And live in the best yeah. city yeah. and work in one yeah. of the most wonderful and industries. And I mean, the film corporation in the early days, now while that was government, they, they did some remarkable stuff. And we should yes. be getting back, that was creative, that was commercial, and it was very, very good. And successful. And successful. Just yeah. quickly, um, we spend obviously billions of dollars yes. uh, propping up Holden. Yes. If you, I take it they're not one of your clients. No. Okay. Not. If you, if you I have worked on the business side in the past. Have you got an, a, a, an overriding sort of comment to make? And then I want to ask you just quickly because yeah. I've only got a few seconds left. But what sort of a campaign would you put to air or oh, good uh, <laughs> to print to resurrect and fix their problem? Well. Uh, at a personal level and a business level, I, the model that we have is unsustainable. And on the day we find out that uh, Margaret Thatcher passed away, she felt the same about the British coal That's industry. That's exactly what I said at the beginning yeah. of the program. Yeah, and so, and I mean, at some stage we've got to bite the bullet. And, but what we should be doing is not just putting people out of work, because that's terrible, that, that's shocking. We should be 
actually creating industries that suit us and suit our creativity and suit our education and suit our lifestyle. I don't see that the car manufacturing in any state in Australia is in the long run uh, can be sustained. No. I, I think that the amount of money taxpayers are paying for every car that's sold is outrageous. Uh, and But, you know, I'm a... I'm, I'm, I work in a private enterprise world. But you're a practical, sensible but man. <laughs> we can't, but I'm practical in this sense too, that I, we can't put people out of work. We can't have no. unemployment. It's terrible. No, 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 no. On many, many levels. It's no. wrong. Yeah. No. Mm. So I take it you don't want the brief? <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> no, no. Andrew, it's great to see you. Thank you so much. And good luck with that. And if there's anything that we can do yes. in the Court of Public Opinion to stir it along. Well, I'd, I'd like to, when I get a few more people involved, I'd love to come back and talk more about it. Great. Because it's in its embryonic stage. Andrew Killey, one of the best advertising brains we have in this country, and he lives here, and his company is based here. So if ever you want any advertising <laughs> agency work, this is the man. Please. Uh, no. <laughs> All right. In the court of public opinion, we shall return. just been told I have a biblical filing system <laughs> and I say what's that God only knows where it is I know it's very clever I, I call it the horizontal filing system and everything just gets put out somewhere on top of something and of course you can never find anything now let me tell you <clears throat> if you're having a birthday this week uh, 1817 the Bank of New South Wales as it was then the first bank in Australia now of course is Westpac it opened uh, 1817, uh, Sir Arthur Streeton was born in 1876, Pablo Picasso died, well, what else? Sir Winston Churchill was made a honorary US citizen on this day in 1963, Paul Robeson was born, uh, what else? Queen Elizabeth II declared that she and her children would be known as the house and family of Windsor, despite of course their surname having been Mountbatten for uh, well, since her marriage in 47, anyway. A whole lot of other interesting things. The Civil War ended with the Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendering to the Union General Ulysses S. Grant, who went on to be president. 1865 was the year. What an awful war that was. Mind you, I don't know that you could have any war that's a good one. Opinion at 44adelaide.com.au if you want to send us a brick bat or ask us a strange question or whatever. Let me introduce you to Dr. Ann Evans. Now, <laughs> Dr. Anne is not a, um, not a plastic surgeon. No, I'm not a plastic surgeon. I do um, medical procedures for appearance and aesthetic reasons. Isn't it interesting that the word plastic surgeon, all of that came out of the, the war, didn't it? It certainly did. A lot of advances in surgery came from wars and certainly plastic surgery uh, really was pioneered in the First World War with the result of burns from all the gases and, and such like. Mm. The Second World War, a lot of orthopaedic type procedures were invented, perfected, and the Vietnam War certainly a lot of uh, limb saving, uh, arterial grafts and such like were um, invented or perfected during that time because you've got young, fit, healthy people, mm. so they're good to work on. Why is it called plastic surgery? It's really called plastic and reconstructive surgery. Um, and I'm really not sure where the name comes from, probably from the Latin, yeah. meaning to alter, to I change. I wonder if those, those wonderful doctors that did so much to restore uh, broken lives would know that um, Hollywood and LA and this industry uh, would, 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 would flourish because people wanted... Uh, <laughs> to enhance. Also yes. been around for a long time. John Wayne was alleged to have had a facelift. Yeah. Marilyn Monroe was alleged to have had some liquid silicon in, in, inje injected into her breasts yeah. because she was pre-breast implant, yeah. um, of course. But I, I suppose it's, a, it's a, a, a sort of question in the court of public opinion. Uh, if you can improve yourself and if there is something that's worrying you, why not, if it's possible, to have it fixed, have it fixed? But why I rang you... Um, was, I saw this story and I thought it most interesting. 
From the moment she stepped onto the world stage, the women of America have admired the Duchess of Cambridge for her poise, grace and style. Now they are lusting after her nose. Royal rhinoplasty is the latest look. US plastic surgeons say as Kate has overtaken Jennifer Aniston, Nicole Kidman and Ashley Simpson to become the most recognized bearer of the real and the most beautiful nose, every woman comes in and wants Kate's nose. Does that happen really? There are certainly fashions and fads and people will often come in to see you with a picture of some sort of improvement or enhancement that they want. Mm. And the number of times that I've asked, uh, been asked if I could have lips like Angelina Jolie, if I'd collected some money from each of those questions, I probably <laughs> wouldn't need to work. Can the average woman have Angelina's lips? Um, well, the first thing to say is that Angelina certainly has fantastic lips, but without doubt she has helped to keep them looking as well as they do now because she's nearly 40 or yeah. 40, so everyone's lips deteriorate over time. Yes. And really the, the skill and talent on my part and my colleagues' part is to assess the patient's face and determine what would be the best for them. And so if you've got a tiny little heart-shaped face, putting large, luscious Angelina Jolie lips hmm. into that face would be doing the patient a disservice, I think. Is there a penalty to be paid uh, later in life? I mean, I often feel terribly sorry for people who go and get a, a tattoo uh, when they're young and then everything sort of changes and it, 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 it must be an ongoing embarrassment. Is there a, a kind of a penalty to be paid later in life with these sort of procedures uh, looking awful as time goes by? Um, certainly if you stop having any of the um, um, procedures that are generally temporary, yeah. you will then age to perhaps where you would have been anyway without the procedures and that can be a, a very big shock for people looking in the mirror yes. but there's not necessarily a penalty for it. Um, is as in the deterioration. Tattoos fascinate me. I, they I am, horrify me. Well, I'm stunned at the number of people who have a tattoo and, uh, I mean, and they will say to me, the young people, well, it's easy, I'll just get it taken off. Well, it's actually not that easy. My clinic does have a tattoo removing laser and it's a big procedure, there's many treatments and it is quite painful. Mm. And I was actually talking to my father the other day about whether the CEOs of the future will look like Joel Madden, whether they will have mm. tattoos and piercings and whether I'm just an old fuddy-duddy and behind the times. I don't somehow think so. But if, if you walk down the street, do you find yourself looking at people and saying, you've had a, and a lift here and a... Mm. I don't consciously do it, but of course if you asked me about somebody, I am normally fairly good at picking what they may or may not have had have, done. Have I, have I had any work? No. No, I haven't. You're naturally but beautiful. <laughs> no, but I have made up my mind that uh, as I get older, I think I'll get a jowl job. Can you have a jowl job? A jowl job is really a neck or a facelift uh, because it's coming from up here. I, I want to get rid everything. of the bags and the jowls. Yes. You know, I think gravity... It takes a terrible Gravity toll. Gravity is a terrible invention, I think. It takes everything down, down, yes. down. And uh, we all do um, pay the price. Of course, because we're Caucasian, we age a little more rapidly than some of our luckier Asian and African um, friends. Um, we age in a linear manner, Caucasian. Mm. So basically, if you've got a graph year and amount of ageing, it's fairly predictable. Asian people don't really age until they're 45. And African people, because they have such strong, beautiful skin, barely age at all. Do you, uh, do you um, subscribe to the uh, idea of the sun being a terribly bad thing? Absolutely. If you came to me, anyone who comes to me and says, what can I do to keep my skin and my appearance as good as possible? There are three things that you have to do. One is not smoke cigarettes. Two is be extremely careful of the sun. Your whole life, the major damage is done between the ages of eight and 18. And that's what comes out later in life with skin cancers, etc., and the ageing, the photo ageing. And the third thing you should do is pick your parents, which can be a little difficult to do, but genes do play a very important part in how you age. Mm, mm. 
So my advice, the best cream that anybody can buy is a sunscreen to wear every single day. Yes. Rain, snow, sleet, whatever, because the UV still sneaks through yes. and causes damage. And men, I take it, to these days are just as likely to seek out your We're professional certainly services. Certainly, seeing more and more men. Yeah. We've always seen them because I've also um, I do a, quite a lot of laser work and for red veins on the face and on the oh, nose, yes. especially people who are cold call people, because um, someone will look at that nose and think, well, he's a drinker, and it's not necessarily alcohol; it's often sun. So we've always seen them. And now we're starting to see more men for perhaps a little bit of Botox to stop um, some lines and wrinkles, a bit of skin rejuvenation, a bit of um, uh, sun damage removal for brown spots and, and things like that. Uh, the subset of the gay men have always been very interested in their appearance and of course they have more disposable income. Mm. So they're often very proactive in looking after themselves. Isn't it funny, they've got disposable income, now they want to get married and ruin everything. Well, why can't they be as unhappy as the rest why of us? Why can't they be as unhappy as the rest of us? I like you very much. Thank you for coming in. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Dr. Anne Evans, this is the Court of Public Opinion. The program that shoots the breeze, never the messenger, the Court of Public Opinion, which I hope you enjoy each and every week. Um, don't forget opinion at 44adelaide.com.au if you've got a comment. These, these are just a couple of interesting ones. Why do you drive into the garage, Jeremy, displaying your number plates when everywhere else on television they're blurred or pixelated? It's not a lovely word, pixelated. Pixelated. Uh, and that's from Bradley. Um, look, I don't know. I've seen that as well. I don't know why they blur the number plates on cars, because you can't drive out of the garage onto the street with a blurred number plate. They'd pick you up immediately. So I don't know what, is it some sort of funny thing about privacy? I don't blur my number plates because, you know, I, cars registered, may as well show something for the money. And I like this one. John says, uh, can the court of public opinion explain why there are sand shoes tied together on overhead electrical wires at intersections all over Australia. What does it mean? I, I look, I, I have absolutely no idea. I haven't prepared the jury for that, but there has to be an explanation because we've all seen them, haven't we? Marina Hamilton Craig, welcome to the jury. Thank you. We're talking about, oh, sorry, interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> interrupt any time you like. It's that kind of program. Saxon Cordeaux. And Coralie Cheney. Hi, Jeremy. I think Welcome. the sanctuary thing is, is purely a, a bit of a game with teenagers. They tie them together and fling them over lines and try to get them to, you know, hook over. Why? Fun. The, there's a lot of urban myth about it. I heard someone say that where you see one of those, that's where you know to go to the next drug deal. <laughs> it's kind of like a... Well, Saxon, you're of an age. Tell me, I mean, what do you know? Actually, I heard, uh, I heard my mother say that. Not so long ago, and I, I laughed. I've, I've never heard of it. Never, never heard of it, apart from... But you must have seen them hanging on... I've seen them. I think it's just boredom. Kids mm. are bored, and they figure, wow, th this looks like fun. I've, I've never heard of a, uh, them positioning, pointing out where, where you can go and buy drugs. Yeah, but never but that, they'd have to be standing in the middle of the road, which would be kind of dangerous anyway. Yeah. And you'd have to be doing it while other people weren't watching, because no one's ever... Anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah. John, I can't help you. I don't know. But somebody may get in touch with us on the, the internet and tell us if uh, someone is better advised. Now, let's get on with this Holden thing. Uh, this has come up. We've taken it to the streets before. We've dealt with it in the court of public opinion. It will not go away. Um, uh, and I feel sorry for both sides. You know, the, the government keeps on putting out the money because politically it cannot afford to have 10,000 jobs, that's all the associated jobs as well, disappear. So they'll keep priming the pump. Mm. Holden will keep taking the money. But we know from our own experience with Mitsubishi, it doesn't work. When the time comes to sack the people or close the factory doors, they've got the money. We don't seem to find it all that easy to claw the money back. Marina, it is the absolutely impossible question to answer, but I'm asking you. I think, I think it is impossible. Basically, keeping people employed is really important because 
if we don't organise, put our money into it so they get draw their salaries, then we put the other money into them in their uh, pen, not pension, what do you get when you... All a benefit you, of benefit, some kind. Yes. So in one way or the other, the government's going to have to support these people if the business isn't sound. The, the question is, how can they make that business more sound? And I don't know. Well, we must be able to make it more sound. We, we know that we are competing with the Chinas and uh, Thailand and uh, other countries that have a be benefit of a larger scale of production. But we know they have cheaper costs. What do we do? We have a government that introduces a carbon tax to make it even more uncompetitive. Yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And the trade union movement does its job, and that is demand higher and higher salaries and more and more benefits, more money, less work, shorter number of hours, all that sort of thing. You can't run a country that way. You can't run a company that way. No, well, absolutely not. I mean, I think the, the question is, is it sustainable to, to keep subsidising... I don't know, what are they spending billions of taxpayers' dollars to subsidise, uh, you know... Is it General Motors Holden? General Motors, but it's not uncommon for countries to be paying, Coralie, a lot of money to car makers just to stay in business. I think, sadly, it is a sinking industry. And I think until such time as we can produce cars as cheaply and the quality of them better than we can get from overseas, um, it, it's going to die. It, it has to because of that issue. Um, unless people on production lines are willing to take a cut salary... Um, equal to those in China or India and that kind of area where we can get cheaper cars, um, it's not going to survive. Mm. Probably costs less than uh, the taxpayers subsidising the, the company to just pay the, pay the workers, get rid of Holden, pay them their salary. But, you know, it's, it's a it's socialist <laughs> utopia by the sound of it. I cost less. Please. I used to live in Sweden and I'm not quite sure if I've got it correctly, but there was some sort of system there. If you bought a Swedish manufactured washing machine, car, fridge, whatever, you got a tax break for it. Yes. So if we encouraged people to buy Australian made things with a tax benefit of some sort, then the company would be doing okay. It would all go around and we would be helping in a very uh, creative sort of way. I like the way you think. This is what you have to say. At what point do we say making cars in Australia is too expensive? Well, I think we should be looking, using that money that's been given to um, the, the Holdens, etc., to be put into alternative energy like wind and solar and actually use those w skilled workers to be put, looking into energy and um, car use for... Um, uh, um, putting that manufacturing overseas and to putting energy into alternative energy in this, in this country and also the manufacture of cars um, that are sustainable cars, not the traditional cars. We've got the technology here now that says that we can make cars without petrol and we should be using that battery powers, etc., to be put into that kind of technology. If they're going to use the car industry, use it in a sustainable way. Well, they shouldn't have sacked all those people because they had that loan from the government. It was their responsibility now to keep the place going. How do you compete with China, though? You can't compete with China. You never. It, Holden's a better car than Chinese made car. Yeah. Believe me, I know that for fact because I've been a Holden's all my life. But I mean, they always exaggerate the price. But well, $50,000 for a car, that's a lot of money. A lot of money. Yeah. Uh, Marina, that's a very good idea you had just a second ago. Um, instead of giving billions and billions of dollars to the car manufacturers, get rid of the state charges like stamp duty, sales tax, registration. Yes. You know, you buy a Holden and you don't pay any of that, would cost a bit, but you know that the money that the government was giving would be going as an incentive to buy the car, which is clever, very clever. No, it's not my idea, it's something I vaguely remember. Or make the local Sweden. product tax deductible yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, the idea of paying people for their organs, I'm talking about live donors, and you can give a piece of your kidney, I understand you can give one, a piece of your liver, you can give uh, one of your kidneys and 
the government has come up with an idea. What do you think of this? Is it a slippery slope? Or is it a good idea to pay someone or someone's employer six weeks, because that's the kind of recuperating period you need after having had that sort of surgery. So you're off work for six weeks. The government pays your employer for that period of time for you to recuperate. Now, is that a slippery slope? Is that clever? Do you think that is going to make people give a kidney, which is really giving someone life? Here's what you think. It's a good initiative, but it's prone with dangers because people will make money, and that's the bad side of it. But anything that can do to save lives and make people's lives better would be would be good thing. Yeah, but at the but same... there's probably a better way of doing it. Mm. At the same time, does he going to encourage people to get rid of grandma <laughs> and sell the kidneys and... Who knows? I mean, there's such a lot of evil people around, isn't there? Six weeks to people to give a kidney so they can recuperate after the operation. Now, is that a slippery slope or a good piece of policy? I reckon that is a slippery slope. I mean, everyone has a right to... I mean, if I had given my kidney away, I wouldn't recover in six weeks. I mean, I would need more time than that, and it would not help my outside things, like school or if I was going to uni. It wouldn't help any of that. Six weeks would not be enough time to cover. And um, I don't know, it depends on the people, whether they donate it or if they'd actually want someone to buy their kidney. It really depends on who's selling the kidney in the first place. If you're, if you're going to, to donate a kidney, whether you have money for it or not, your body, your health is still going to be in the same situation. You've done something for somebody else. And if you choose to do that, I really think that it's a, it's a choice thing which I would, um, probably I'm too old now, but, but if it's necessary, uh, if, if, if you, to, to do so, if you choose to do it, I don't think you need to be paid for it. I think that should be something that you do to save someone else's life. Now, Marina, uh, wife of a famous doctor, but he, he, I, he's a heart doctor, isn't he? So uh, the idea of transplants from people who have died and generously left uh, organs is a great thing, but it's not really working sufficiently well. What do you think of paying people? You mean like paying blood donors or paying? Well, they do pay donor. blood donors yes, in other yes, parts of the yes, world, yes, don't they? They do. I think that giving of your own body, mm. and I mean usually it's to a relative, isn't it? Because you're mm. you're matched, uh, you know, to give a kidney say to your brother or to your niece or someone you match with it's it as you say it's a gift of life it's a brave it's a kind it's a wonderful thing to do and it, it to get to someone to allow that person to recuperate to, to have to rush back to work in pain or to perhaps not do it because you're supporting two children i think it's a lovely idea it, I, um, I like every lovely idea Almost everything is, uh, you know, it can be used incorrectly. But I think that whatever we can do to support those mm. people, to help them be so generous, yes. is wonderful. Saxon, uh, to me it's the amount of money. If you start putting thousands and thousands of dollars in front of people, you might get people doing it for the wrong reason. Yeah, I'd, probably. You'd get, you'd get some people doing that. I, I donate blood. Uh, yeah, we don't get paid for that. In Australia, no. but uh, I, I think uh, you know if I donated a kidney to someone, I'd never want to work ever again. <laughs> Six weeks off, yeah, I don't know about that. But um, the future, I that's mean, that's your price. Yeah, that's my price. <laughs> I'm right, uh, working again. <laughs> You're young. It's a lovely young kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, I want to get paid properly for that. Who decides on the price? Yeah. But look at the future uh, with what's going to be happening 10, 20 years time. And, well, they can do it now. They can 3D print. A kidney, you can 3D print organs. So will they've it, done it with a kidney. Work? Yeah, yeah. So they, they can do it with stem cells and layer by layer. You've seen, you've seen the printing. And they can grow these things. Yeah. Like I'm the pretty sure the they... Mouse? Yeah, the ear yeah. and the mouse. Yes, and, uh, yeah. So I don't know, I think... Uh, I'm, I'm going to sit down for a while and think about what I'd like to grow. <laughs> <laughs> you can grow anything. So I could grow a car, maybe. <laughs> Well, that's you know, maybe how they should be just... You know, everyone's going to be printing their own cars printing in the future. Yeah. How do I feel like driving today? <laughs> <laughs> it's printed. Coralie? 
I think it potentially could open a can of worms um, and is potentially dangerous um, for people getting on the wrong side of it. And, and you hear about these stories overseas where you know people are knocked out and wake up in the morning and their kidney's gone. And um, look, when it is done for love, it's a beautiful thing, as Marina said, but there, are, there could be a lot of people saying, I need six weeks off, I'll donate a kidney just so I can get paid while I have six weeks off work, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and there's potential risks with that too. What happens if they then need a kidney down the track if their mm. one fails and yeah. all of that? So, I mean, it, it's, it's fraught with danger, I think. Yeah. The, uh, in, the, in the general term, I think they should have an opt-out system. So everyone on his or her licence is assumed to be an organ donor, everyone. And the only way that that is not the case is if you opt out mm. and say, no, I won't do it. But that's it, in the case of death. Yes, yes, mm. yes. But uh, that's the great shortfall. We're not, we, don't, we just don't have enough mm. organ donors. And if we did, we probably wouldn't need to have live donors. Ex absolutely right. Now, the other question we went out onto the street with is, is this one, which is a you know, brainstorming kind of a question. Uh, and I don't know there's an answer to it. Uh, maybe there's a different answer for every single person. But what makes you happy? What is it that makes your day, makes your week, makes your life, makes for that wonderful moment uh, where you say, I'm just so happy. What is it? Complicated, big, simple, natural, man-made? What is it? Is it money? Here's what you say. Yes, it is the kids, just them. If they're happy, then I'm happy too. So being with my family and, yeah, just being out and about and enjoying the day. What makes people happy? Do you have a thought on that? Um, absolutely. I think it's different for everybody. Um, for me personally, being happy is being healthy, um, having good relationships in my life, good connections with people, lovely weather makes a good difference, and living in such a great country as Australia. Well, I guess a walk on the beach with my partner or Skyping with my parents in Germany. What makes you both happy? Cash. Cash. Any particular amount? Just having cash makes me so happy. Now, why do you say that? Is that freedom or freedom of choice or what? The ability to go get whatever you want. It's, it's normal. People say money doesn't buy happiness, but anything that you really think about that makes you happy, you go visit a friend, you need fuel to get there or, you know, a plane ticket, you know, everything requires cash. Yes. Yes. And you, ma'am? My fiance. <laughs> Peace, contentment, calm, the knowledge that I'm okay, I'm I'm self-contained, I'm I'm content that I have the wherewithal to look after myself and leave something to my beautiful, beautiful child and grandchildren. Coralie, what makes you happy? Gosh, Jeremy, I mean, you talk to some people, you know, they might be wealthy and they're not happy. You talk to poor people, they are happy. You know, it's not necessarily money or things you have or health or any of those things. I think it's attitude. Dad, my dad used to say, tell an old story about this man who had two sons. Hmm. One was a pessimist and one was the optimist. And he couldn't work out why these two sons were so different. So he did a little test with them and he put the pessimist in a room full of brand new toys. And he came back an hour later and the kid was just sitting there, all grumpy. And he said, what are you doing? You've got a room full of brand new toys. He said, oh yeah, but there's, you know, there, there's a trick here and if I break one, I'm gonna get in trouble and da da da. And he, and he was negative about the whole thing. In the meantime, he'd put the optimist, the other son, into a room full of horse manure. And he came back an hour later and the kid was having a wonderful time. He was riding on the walls <laughs> with it and he was throwing it in the air and he was sliding in it. And dad said, what are you doing? He said, well, Dad, with all this horse manure in here, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it really does boil down Lovely. to your attitude. Yes. Um, obviously, Dad had a thing about manure, but the other thing he used to say <laughs> was that if you sit in manure and wallow, yes. you know, you, you, you can do that or you can pack it up, you know, write yeah, manure on it, it, sell it and make money. Yes. What are you going to do? Yes, it's sort of like if, you know, if, if, you, if life is a lemon, you can start squeezing and making lemonade and, make lemonade. and sort of stand up yeah. in the street and you never know. So I think it's attitude. Sex? Mm. Yeah, no, I can agree with that. Um, but there are certain things that will trigger the good old serotonin and dopamine levels in my brain, which is, I guess, what we all call being happy. 
um, driving your cars, for example. <laughs> oh, <laughs> leading answer. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I'm going flying on Thursday uh, with a glider, without yeah. uh, one of those planes with our engines. That's nice, nice knowing that's you. That's good fun, yeah. Nice knowing you. Yeah, you can keep the inheritance. <laughs> Knock yourself out. Um, what else? I mean, you know, little things, being on the beach, um, a tropical island with a mojito in my hand with pretty girls around me. I mean, that. Yeah. I, I think I'd have a so sloppy grin on my face for a long time. So it's sort of the experience rather than uh, a physical possession or a... Mm. Mostly, yeah. Marina? You're going to think I'm pathetic. Absolutely. I like little things. I, you know, I, I think that you, know, you wake up and you hear the birds and you mm. sort of lie there and you think, oh, you know, it's morning. Or I like a fluffy towel after a shower. Yes. I like a nicely set yes. tray for breakfast. I, th I think life is my father. We were talking, listen listen to, to the birds. Yeah. I mean, that, I cue the birds. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's amazing. <laughs> they just started uh, singing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. But it's lovely. I mean, it is yes. nice. And I think nature, being a bit in touch with nature, I think is very nice. I think that does make a person happy. If you're grumpy and in a bad mood, you walk around like your beautiful garden. Doesn't your garden make you happy? Yes. Yes, yes it does. Yeah. It does. Uh, the, the simpler things are really nice. Uh, a hot shower yes. on a cold morning. And you a just log fire. Yes. Log fire, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you open a cake of soap. Yes, it smells lovely. And the, yeah. it smells wonderful. Yeah. It's a simple thing, but yeah. it's a luxurious yes. thing. Yes, little luxury. And mm. I think life is made up, my father used to say, life is mosaics. There's no big thing. They're just lots and lots of tiny things that you build, build into your life. And on the converse, what makes me unhappy is a negative experience. If, if I go into a shop and someone's grumpy or a bit unpleasant, that absolutely shrivels my soul. Yes, they just really don't want to be there, you yes. see, and they kind of uh, uh, radiate I, that to But I everybody. think you have to do it back. You know, if you're in a uh, street and you see someone with looking terrific, I think you should say, great outfit. I mm. think you should be nice. To, you should make happy as well as take happy. Mm. Mm. Marina, bless you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you all for coming. You're a wonderful jury. <laughs> uh, we did get a little feedback about the sand shoes on top of the electrical wires. Uh, we'll have more next week, but <laughs> uh, apparently, well, some people believe uh, that when someone loses his or her virginity, uh, the shoes are tied together. Oh, what the shoes have to do with it, I don't know. And they are thrown up over the wires as a symbol of having uh, passed this way. Go figure. <laughs> Betty Samus will be with us in a moment or two. She's been around and she'll tell everything she knows in a sec. I do hope you're enjoying the show, if it's your birthday or wedding anniversary or a special week for one reason or another. Uh, Paul Ivano died. He was 83, motion picture, television, hospital, Woodlands, California. French-born cinematographer, believed to be the first cameraman. Listen to this, you guys. First cameraman in the world to use a helicopter for aerial movie scenes. In fact, he helped to film the chariot race in the silent version of uh, Ben-Hur. And one more, Walter Hunt. Nobody remembers him, but on this day he invented and patented the safety pin, 1849. What did people do before safety pins? Oh, hello. How, How are, are you? you, Betty? I was just admiring your son. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, would you like him? I can have him gift wrapped. Uh, yeah, pro you possibly can. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised what you can do, Jeremy. We did earlier uh, with the jury, what mm -hmm. makes you happy. I'd, I'd be interested to know what makes you, apart from a gift wrapped Saxon, what what? <laughs> I actually thought Saxon would say, what makes me happy is being a Cordeaux. What makes... I've never heard that from him. Well, oh, well, I, I know, because <laughs> he's having no. too much fun being one. No. <laughs> really? Uh, what oh. makes me happy, you know what makes me happy? Children make me happy. Yes. And moments with friends make me happy. Moments in life make me happy, where I can sit there and go, you know what, I'm actually really happy now. Yes. Like I am now. Good. Because you know why? 
I went to the Adelaide Cabaret Festival launch and one of my favourite performers of all time, Edina Menzel, will be performing. That makes me happy. Right. Tell mm. me about the show. Well, the Adelaide Cabaret Festival uh, uh, has been around now for like 12 or 13 years and it is one of the best cabaret festivals in the world. And the fantastic thing with the Cabaret Festival is that it, uh, you've got Australian performers, you've got local performers, and then they bring the overseas performers like Adina Menzel. Shane Warne, the musical, will be featured this year at... <laughs> Do you like Shane I can't Warner, the picture festival? Shane Wall, Warner Look, musical. Do you know Eddie Perfect? He uh, is in a show called Offspring and he is such a talented writer. He came up with the idea because he thought, look, Shane Warne's in, in all the headlines. This guy would actually make a great musical. So what he did is he sat down by his piano and wrote this musical and he's got He's got a Verity um, uh, Hunt ball ballad and she played Mary Poppins. So there's also mm. Liz Hurley character with Christy Whelan. Yeah. She uh, performed in Xanadu and did an amazing job. I saw both of them. They are great. So that's one of the acts. Yep. Now, we had, they had some people performing. Paul Capsis was absolutely, absolutely captivating. He's a Sydney performer. You've never, have you ever seen Paul perform? No, no. You've given me a, a copy yeah. of the program to look at. Tom Berlinson's in it. That's great. He's a fantastic talent. Tom Berlinson is amazing. And guess who they are bringing over from America? Christine Chenoweth. Now, she was the witch. That's right. She played the part of Glinda in Wicked, the original witch. Which, uh, the, the original witch, that's right. And Dina Menzel was the original Elphaba on Broadway. So I don't know how you remember these names. Because I'm a fanatic when it comes to these things and I have no life. That's all I do. <laughs> so Christine Jenner with Tom Burns, Eddie Perfect, uh, Shane Warne, the musical, Paul Capsis, Darren Percival, tribute to uh, Ray Charles. You remember him from The Voice last mm -hmm. year. Among so many other acts. So it's something to get you know, into in winter, you rug up, yeah. and you go to the festival theatre. How well uh, patronised is it? Lots of people go? Absolutely packed. It's like the Adelaide Fringe. You can see yeah. two or three shows in a night. There's a little bar area. Yep. The acts come out. They mingle with the people. Kate Soprano comes and talks to the people. There's all these food stalls outside. You can grab your food and a coffee, and it's nice and warm. I love it. Yeah. Well, the more festivals and things like that we have, the better. Shows off our city to great advantage. That's right. Now, something I have found out about you, not only are you fascinated with cars, but I hear you're fascinated with aviation. Oh, yes. Didn't you buy Nancy Bird Walton's home? Yes. I want to know more about this. Oh, well, it's a lovely home and uh, she was an incredible woman. She, she was the first female pilot. Yeah, her, she had a, her licence. Yes. She was taught by Kingsford Smith to fly and he had licence number one. She had licence number two. And she must have been only a teenager when she learned to fly. And she flew all her life, even into her 90s. She was still a co-pilot. Can you imagine keeping <laughs> your skills up that to that extent? That is unbelievable. No, wonderful. You wonderful woman. amaze me, Jeremy, with everything that you do. I love it. Well, you're sweet. Thank <laughs> you. So anyway, speaking of aviation, the Barossa Air Show is on this weekend. And look, it's a great family day out. Uh, the day begins at 10 o'clock and it finishes at 4 in the afternoon. And there's aircraft vintage, which you would love, old yes. and new. <laughs> I tag them off. <laughs> yes. By plans. Uh, three of Australia's top aerobatic champions will be there giving displays. And there's also helicopter rides. Uh, they'll run. Maybe Shane will be down there with his helicopter giving the kids rides. Shane, you for imagination. Oh, yes. He never ceases to amaze me what he does with his helicopter. Anyway, and uh, there's uh, art and craft stores, sideshows, and interesting. Exhibit. So you have a great day with the family and it's $50 for two adults and two children and under five is free. And I think Saxon's going. And where is it? The Barossa Airport. I think it's at the Barossa Airport. That's See, right. I didn't know the Barossa had an airport. Well, I just found out ten seconds ago that they do. I just agreed with what you said then. Well. Fabulous. I didn't know. Anyway. I know you, well, well, I, it's good <laughs> to learn all this stuff. And I am learning from you week after week. Now, school holidays are coming up. Went and saw a great movie, Adventures in Zambezia. It's made in South Africa. They didn't have a really big budget, but it came out so well. It's an animated movie mm -hmm. about a bird that flies the nest to discover adventures in Zambezia. And he tries out for the hurricanes, which are birds that protect Zambezia. Look, you've got humour in there. You've got community spirit. You've got cooperation. You've got teamwork. Great messages for the children. They're going to be on well, a high. It doesn't sound like Africa to me. Was there a coup? 
like uh, some crazy general <laughs> killing people? Well, there was a crazy lizard that wanted to take over Zambezia. So all the birds got together and they fought this lizard. And I won't say what happens at the end. But you know what? It's movies like this that make me cry. Mm. I cried in Shrek. I cried in Lion King. I should not go and see these movies. I want to get Christopher... Uh, onto the show so he can let yeah. me know what he thought of it. Well, he, for a 12-year-old, he'll go and review the movies for, for that age. <laughs> Lovely to see you, Betty. <laughs> Lovely to see you too, Jeremy. See thank you. Next week. Thank Take you. care of yourself. Betty Samus. Now, our pet of the week, thank you to Peter Sellen at the Animal Welfare League, the pet of the week. If you are looking for a, uh, a pet, uh, here's one that really needs a home and you just might be perfect for each other. Pepper. Pepper, Pepper. Hello, I'm Pepper. And I'm the Animal Welfare League Pet of the Week. I am a fun 18-month-old female bull terrier cross. Very pretty dog. I'm friendly, outgoing, energetic. Sometimes I forget how boisterous I can be, don't we all? So I would be best suited to a family without small children. I'm a clever dog that would respond well to training. Oh, I can have my children as well. I would love to find a home with an owner who shares my enthusiasm for life. Could that be you? I am desexed, microchipped, vaccinated, health checked, perfect. Only $310. Come see me at the Animal Welfare League, 1 to 19 Cormac Road at Wingfield, 83481300. And my thanks to Peter Sellen, who does such a wonderful job trying to place all these very deserving animals. Have a wonderful week. Thank you so much for your company. And if somebody stops you in the street and says, well, I'm from the Court of Public Opinion, would you mind making a comment on whatever? Thank you for doing that. The Court of Public Opinion is my registered trademark. Believe in yourself. I'm Jeremy Cordo. Goodbye for now.